Oh, fantastic to be here. Uh, thanks for the invite from the organizers and, and putting on an awesome conference. I've been listening all day, so it's been, been really enjoyable. So for me today, uh, I'm going to be covering uh, just a brief intro of what, what is Lambda, just a level set in case people aren't familiar with it. Uh, I'm going to be talking about why we need uh, serverless best practices, uh, why we can't just use our, our standard ways of working. And then I'm going to be talking a little bit about observability and logging and metrics and tracing uh, and how we've built uh, Lambda Power Tools for Java to, to help with some of these observability challenges, best practices challenges. Uh, and then right at the end, I'm going to be covering uh, a topic that comes up a lot with customers that I work with, which is idempotency. And uh, if you've just been watching Grace's talk about the saga pattern, you'll see some similarities there. So who am I? Uh, yeah, I'm Mark Sales. Um, uh, I've been using Java since I was a student at university. You know, I learned Python and C++, but, but Java was the only thing I really got and I really enjoyed Java. So uh, I've just been using Java ever since and it's a pretty long time now. It's coming up to nearly 20 years. Um, before I was an employee of AWS, I was a customer. I really enjoyed using Lambda and I've been using Lambda for about five years now. Um, and the great thing is now that I'm an employee, I get to <laughs> use Lambda pretty much every day. I work with customers uh, uh, pretty much every day who are, who are looking to adopt Lambda with Java. Uh, and I'm hearing a lot of success stories and a lot of challenges. And I've been using that feedback to, to help build the project that we're going to be talking about, which is an open source project called Lambda Power Tools for Java. So if you Google Lambda Power Tools Java, it'll pop up and uh, you can have a look at the GitHub page and our documentation page. So first things first, uh, how, what is AWS Lambda and, and how is it different to, to what I'm doing at the moment? Well, AWS Lambda is, is, a, is a compute service which operates almost like a, a web service. So you're not running a server, you're not running a, a, a server listening to a poll. Your code is triggered on the response of an event. Okay, so you might have an event which represents a HTTP request or a message from some sort of queue, or an event that something has been uploaded to an S3 bucket, uh, and Lambda will execute the code that you've given it in response to those events. Okay, and that that code that you deliver can do anything. Okay, you know that can connect to AWS services, it can connect to a database, it can talk to another third party API, uh, whatever you need it to do. Okay, so Lambda is going to be invoked automatically if you've integrated it with a queue. The Lambda service is going to integrate tightly with that queue and deliver messages to your code. Uh, automatically, so you don't have to configure any any integration with that with that queue. There is a limitation on the execution time, so you're limited to 15 minutes. And between uh, executions of your code, the Lambda function is paused, so the the VM that the the your code runs on is paused, um, and you don't pay for it. So Lambda is charged per invocation per invocation and for the amount of milliseconds that you use uh, the memory allocation for, okay? So it's uh, based on a millisecond billing, which I think is amazing. So how is this different? Well, if you have a container or a VM, um, your code is actually gonna be polling some sort of queue or, or um, a stream, if that's the, the workload that you have. Obviously, there's no limit on the time um, that your container can run for. You can you can spin that up and, and turn it off whenever you like. But because it is running continuously, you are most likely paying for that running time, whether it's up or not. And you know, not just a cost, but uh, a carbon cost as well. So AWS Lambda doesn't really have uh, the idea of running a server. Um, you probably very familiar with running a server, like a you know, Spring Boot application on a container. But uh, Lambda isn't like that. Lambda would receive a HTTP uh, event, uh, an event which represents a HTTP request, whereas a container would receive uh, and respond directly to that HTTP request. So a little bit different. 
Um, and it's good to understand the differences. A container can run multiple uh, requests at once. So you can have multiple threads in the container. But in a, in a Lambda world, a Lambda function has uh, a concept of an execution environment. So an execution environment is an isolated uh, virtual machine. And we use our own virtual machine technology called Firecracker, which is a micro uh, VM. It starts up very quickly and has a very small footprint. And that, and that plays to our security and isolation story really well. Uh, customers, uh, or if you have a function, your uh, function code will never share the same VM as another customer's. So we are very, very isolated in that way. So each of your Lambda functions runs on a VM, on a bare metal instance, and is not uh, your, your VM is never shared with any other customers. And it's actually never shared with any of your other functions. And each execution environment just handles one event at a time. So it's a very simple programming model. So there's a lot of benefits to this. Um, you're really offloading a lot of responsibilities and pain to AWS. So things like server patching, it's all handled by AWS. Things like runtime patching, so the JVM patching is all handled by AWS. And you're just paying for when you're using your system. So you don't have to think about, you know, how much capacity do I need? And, you know, do I need to, uh, you know, plan capacity for, for peak usage? Um, you're just paying for what you use. Uh, and your carbon footprint is, is effectively just what you use as well. Because Lambda has a lot of native integrations, you, you can really rapidly produce uh, applications because a lot of the code that you may write is already uh, part of the Lambda service. So you don't have to write an integration with Kafka uh, and manage the offset. Uh, the Lambda service will do that for you. and You just get to uh, focus on the business problem. Um, Lambda really helps you to produce distributed architectures. It's naturally a, a horizontally scaling uh, service. So as your traffic increases, because it, a Lambda function will only um, handle one event at a time, uh, the Lambda service is just going to keep creating uh, execution environments to handle the load that you put through the system. Uh, and this talk, uh, and this conference has been really interesting. Lots of really interesting talks about uh, methods to improve Java's startup time. So things like uh, GraalVM and uh, Project Crack are really innovating in this area. Um, and we also naturally uh, enables uh, teams to, to talk in an event-driven way, which really helps in a microservice architecture and enables teams to work in parallel a lot more easily than if you were working in, in one large application. But with every technology choice, there's obviously uh, benefits and challenges. Uh, and some of the challenges uh, that you'd have in a, in a microservice architecture um, you're going to have using AWS Lambda. You have lots of um, functions to in different tasks. And we really want to think about uh, you know, how we can help in that area. And that's what I'm going to focus on today. I'm going to be focused on how can we, how can we really help um, developers to understand the flow through their systems as they're building serverless architectures and distributed architectures with, uh, with different services, um, no matter what they are. Okay, so the first bit I'm going to talk about is uh, is logs. So everyone's favorite topic, everyone's got an, an opinion on, on how logging should be, uh, and I guess I'm the same. So this is a this is an architecture from uh, DAZN, and DAZN is a, a media uh, company that produces um, uh, sports media over over the internet, uh, and they showed off some of their architecture on a YouTube uh, video that you can watch. Um, and I'm really not going to dig into this, but what I wanted to show is that, you know, modern architectures are distributed, have lots of different components. And it's really important that we build um, systems as developers to understand uh, these distributed architectures. Okay. Uh, and one of the cool things about AWS Lambda is that you don't really need to worry about centralized logging. So uh, a Lambda function automatically follows the 12-factor um, the uh, guidelines. And anything that you produce to stand it out will automatically get shipped to another Amazon service called Amazon CloudWatch. And this is where you can look at your application logs all in one place. 
So even if you have a thousand uh, Lambda uh, execution environments, they're all going to get centralized to CloudWatch and they're all searchable in one place. So you don't need to uh, need to worry about that. There's no sidecars, there's no configuration. It just happens automatically. So that's really cool. But uh, as developers, we've got a real, uh, um, we've got our ways of working and, and producing logs. Uh, and I, I've <laughs> used so many different frameworks over the years, you know, Log4j, Logback, uh, all sorts. Uh, and, you know, sometimes I've not thought about the logs that I'm producing and I've uh, ended up making more log statements, redeploying, add more log statements, redeploying. I guess we all have. Um, but at the moment, I'm really enjoying uh, logging using structured logs. Uh, and what I mean by this is actually producing uh, my logs as JSON objects. Um, and then the message element or attribute of that log is just one part of it. So I've also got attributes for things that I'm really interested in. So that in this case, it might be the product, um, the order ID or the product account. You know, they're specific attributes that I've added to this structured message. And then I can use some really uh, cool um, search uh, methods in, in uh, Amazon CloudWatch or, or some other services. I can take that structured logging and actually query uh, on the attributes instead of you know, just a free text search. So I'm, I'm getting a really powerful um, uh, mechanism here. So I can say, you know, give me the last 20 errors and warnings, or you know, I really want to follow um, this product ID as it goes through the system. Or you might have a correlation ID that you've you've produced and passed through the system. So show me all the logs from all the different microservices that produce uh, and have output this correlation ID. Okay, so this is this is you know kind of why we built Lambda Power Tools is that we we received a lot of feedback of you know how do I do this? How do I do that? You know this is difficult. Uh, this is really interesting. Um, and the more we talked to the customers, the more we found that we were, we were identifying the same same challenges. So we've produced this open source project, and it is just for AWS Lambda. It's really just focusing on, on Lambda as a as a as a platform and only Lambda. So we're not making any um, trade offs for other platforms. We're just focusing on Lambda, and we're really hoping that we can uh, ease some of the adoption pains uh, and really help you to adopt best practices really. Uh, easily. We're keeping the framework as lean as possible because we really understand that, that startup times are really challenging. Um, so wherever possible, we're, we're really focusing on, on, on picking lean choices, but also we understand that uh, customers have favorite ways of working. So we're, we're trying to uh, cover both bases at once. Okay, so uh, how does Power Tools look? What does it look like? How do I use it? Well, in most cases, uh, we've implemented uh, the functionality as annotations. Um, these are um, annotations um, where we're uh, manipulating the code at build time. So there is no runtime run aspect of uh, Power Tools. So there is no uh, you know, additional cost at, um, at startup for using Power Tools. It all happens at build time. Okay, so this is how we do uh, logging in Power Tools. Um, so we really want to uh, add our additional value to, to the process. So we want to take all of the interesting Lambda information and add that to your logs so that all the logs that you produce have all the information that we think you'll require uh, automatically. So in this case, uh, this Lambda function will automatically be injected with the Lambda request ID. If there is an X-ray trace ID, that will be added as well. And we'll also automatically add uh, whether there's been a cold start or not. And there's a whole heap of other information that you can, you can add as well. Uh, just have a look on the docs. Now I mentioned that you know in a microservice architecture, you might already be passing some sort of correlation ID. And obviously we as the developers, we don't know, uh, developers of the framework, we don't know what that is. But we've allowed you to, to specify where the correlation ID is within your event. So you can use a JSON pointer expression to, to grab that correlation ID, automatically put it into your logging, and then whenever you make a log statement, that will be there. And again, if you're using some of our other native services, so things like API Gateway, API Gateway has 
um, a request ID, which is unique. So it's a really good way of starting a correlation ID. Uh, and we know the path of that, obviously, because it's an AWS service. So we've, we've added that to a, to a constant. So it's really easy to get up and running with that. There's always times where you know things go a little bit wrong and you need to turn on uh, uh, debug logging. Yeah, I'm sure we've all been there. Um, but if we're producing debug logs, it's very easy to, to be overwhelmed and, and just have too much information. So we've added um, a mechanism to do sampling. Uh, so if we uh, put sampling on, then only a certain percentage of uh, Lambda function executions uh, will be logged at, at debug logging. So if, if for this function uh, execution it is on, all of those logs for, for debug for this function will be logged. If it's off, none of them will. And this is, a, I think, a really cool way of being able to, to interact with you know, a large distributed system, but in a controlled way. OK, so that's, uh, that's logging. And then we'll jump over to metrics. So when I talk about when I talk about metrics, I think metrics falls into kind of two camps. I think there's metrics about the service, um, so things like uh, error rates, uh, throttles, duration, you know, amount of uh, invocations to the service. They're they're about the service that your application is running in, and these are all produced automatically by AWS Lambda. And there's some other ones that are produced there, and they're automatically shipped. Um, without you having to do anything to CloudWatch, and you can interrogate them in CloudWatch uh, and see what's happening with Lambda. But the more interesting ones and the ones that we need to focus on, are what I would call custom metrics, and these are about your particular business domain. So what is your application doing? And what is it that's important about your business logic? Okay, so, you know, is there an order that's been canceled? You know, that's a really interesting metric. If you see a spike, in canceled orders, you know, what does that mean for your business? You know, it could be, it could be anything else. It could be, you know, products in a, or value in a basket. Is that going up over time? Um, you know, has there been a problem that you need to alert a human being about? Do you need to raise a support ticket? All sorts of things. And eventually you're probably, probably going to be making some sort of dashboard. So this is a cool dashboard that's been created on uh, CloudWatch with some of the metrics. So how would we normally do this? Well, the way I've done this in the past is that my application would have a, a metrics endpoint, and then I would have some sort of collector that pulled that endpoint uh, and collected metrics for that application. So my application would, would know how to produce metrics, uh, and they would be output as some sort of uh, rest, end, rest endpoint. Well, we can't really take that approach with Lambda because the security model and the isolation model means that there is no inbound network access to a Lambda execution environment. You know, we want to keep these environments as, as safe and as secure as possible. So we just don't let uh, uh, network connections come into them. And also, if your Lambda function is, is scaling up and down, then we're producing more and more execution environments. So understanding which execution environment might be up or down at any time is kind of hard. And even if an execution environment has uh, been up and is executing something, it's going to be paused and, and frozen uh, straight after the, the function is returned. So there's nothing really for the metric collector to, to go and interpret. So how might we do this instead? How do we, how do we manage our custom metrics? Well, we could uh, make a direct call to Amazon CloudWatch. So there's an API where we can put a metric or, or multiple metrics um, directly. But again, this is uh, not, not ideal and not a best practice in my opinion, because you're making a synchronous API call to CloudWatch, you're actually delaying the response from Lambda. And we always want to respond as soon as possible to have the best possible customer experience, but also because Lambda is charged uh, by duration. So a longer duration is actually a higher cost. So you're paying more because the duration is longer, and you're also paying because the, the API method is uh, charged as well. So what is the solution here? How do I do this? Well, my, my favorite way of doing this is by using something called CloudWatch Embedded Metrics Format. 
And I imagine there's not many people listening who have heard of this. And it's a real shame because this is like a really, really cool aspect of, of serverless and using Lambda. So this is a JSON object that represents a metric. And if I produce this special format um, um, conforming to the EMF uh, specification to standard out, then automatically uh, Amazon CloudWatch is going to recognize that, that that log message that is automatically um, um, handling from Lambda is an EMF uh, schema, and it's going to produce automatically the metric for you. So this is all going to happen uh, asynchronously. So this is all going to happen um, with no um, no delay to your Lambda function, and you're not paying for an extra uh, put API uh, call either. So it's a really slick way of, of producing um, metrics, and it follows all of the kind of ideals that you want. So it's all asynchronous, there's no additional charges. Um, it's all just following uh, kind of expected patterns. Okay, so that sounds awesome. How is it looking power tools? Well, again, it's a, it's a, a metrics annotation. And this uh, annotation is going to validate and do all the serialization and flush that output to standard out before your function uh, responds. So just before, uh, and this is really cool. You don't have to, you know, handle that all uh, that quite lengthy JSON object. Uh, you get to work with, uh, you know, a Java object instead. And I feel like it's a much better way of working. And we've got some really cool functionality. So, you know, a lot of customers were saying, you know, where's the metric that shows me the number of cold starts that I've had? Well, okay, we can add a attribute to the metrics annotation and we'll produce for you a special metric that shows you the number of cold starts for a Lambda function. And in the same vein as, uh, as logging, we want to um, make sure that all of our functionality is, re is really easy to, to trace uh, across multiple different services. So because all of this uh, data is, is produced as logs, you can still just search the EMF data just like you can search um, application logs. So if I produce um, my EMF output with uh, metadata, I can inject the booking ID or the customer ID or, or any other sort of uh, identifier I work I can work with. So you know I can then tie together you know the logs that my application has produced, the metrics that is emitted, and I, I'm starting to build a really strong picture uh, of what my application has been doing. Okay, so the logs, the metrics, onto tracing. So with tracing, you've probably seen uh, graphs like this, which show you the application uh, and how much time uh, the application has spent in which parts of the application. So you get this sort of uh, sectioned uh, graph uh, and the, the wider the sections, the more time has been spent in, in each area. And again, you know, this is, this is super typical. People have been doing this for a long time. You know, I remember doing this with uh, App Dynamics uh, early on in my career. Very interesting stuff. Um, and this has been done in the past with things like uh, Java agents, um, and they are probably a little bit heavyweight for for Lambda functions. Lambda functions tend to be a bit smaller, and you don't want to do like heavy uh, reflection based analysis early on in the in the application. So we've produced an annotation again. Um, which you can put onto uh, any method and it will produce uh, a, a trace segment uh, for the uh, duration of that method. And by default, it will use the method name as the segment name. But if you want to specify it to be something else, then you can use an attribute, of the tracing annotation, and you can do that as well. What we want to do is just make tracing as simple as possible and just uh, help you to produce uh, tracing that's really useful. So out of the box, we will um, again produce any cold site information as an annotation. And also if you if your application produces an exception for whatever reason, we'll take that full exception and add it to the metadata of the trace. 
So just all of these things that are our best practices that we would advise you to do anyway is automatically included in the framework. So um, it's one less thing to think about. And I guess on that line, you know, uh, you know, I really love to hear your feedback about uh, open telemetry. So we've been talking about, you know, X-ray and how X-ray works, but open telemetry is this new standard. You know, should power tools support open telemetry? You know, what would that look like? You know, would how would you like us uh, to develop that if, you know, if that is of interest to you? So yeah, please hit me up on Twitter and, and let me know what you think. Okay. Now on to the last topic, which is a real interest of mine. You know, I've always come from a, an event driven uh, world where I've done a lot of uh, real time or near real time uh, processing of information. Uh, so this is a real interesting area for me. So idempotency, what is idempotency? Well, idempotent operations will return the same result when they are called multiple times with the same parameters. Okay. So, you know, we don't want banking transactions to happen twice. Okay. Or probably don't. Maybe we'll get some extra money in some cases, but uh, ultimately our systems want to be able to identify uh, whether something is a retry or not. Uh, and if it is, we don't want to uh, execute the same functionality twice. So that, that's the problem with item potency. So let's, let's walk through a couple of examples. So say we have a, a client uh, and they've made a request to, to your application, uh, and maybe you've written that data to a database. Well, you know, more and more applications are on mobile devices or on, on, uh, poorly default, uh, poorly performing networks. And maybe, you know, your app has done everything right. It's produced a response and maybe the client just hasn't, hasn't received the response. Okay. So the client is going to probably send another request. Now, if that request is the same as the first request, should I be writing that data to a database? Is that a duplicate or not? And it's hard for the application to understand that. And this is the problem with item potency. Now, ideally, the, the client should maybe send some sort of identifier to identify whether this is a duplicate request or not. And we would call this an item potency key or an item potency ID. So that's, that's the ideal situation is where the client is able to uh, be aware and send that information. And it is a client's responsibility to, to send that information. Now, that isn't always the case. You know, uh, sometimes we're working with third party systems where we can't change the API. Uh, and we've got methods to, to help you in that case. But the ideal situation is that the client understands the ID, item potency, and sends it to the application. So, you know, client sends uh, item potency ID or item potency key of ABC. Application understands that and writes it to the database. Uh, if we lose a response and we send another request with the same item potency ID, we want the application to understand that this is a duplicate and not to do the, uh, the business activity and to respond in the same way um, and not to confuse the client. Uh, and this isn't just a, a client, um, client server problem. This is also very much a, um, uh, a messaging a uh, system problem as well. If you're, if you're reading messages from a queue, more and more messaging, uh, systems, um, aren't, um, exactly once delivery because they're large distributed systems. They're at least once, uh, messaging, um, style. So it's, it could well be the case that in normal operations and everything is working perfectly that, uh, you receive the same message twice. Uh, from Amazon SQS, which is our, our queuing service. So you should really be looking to, to handle uh, those, um, that programming model. So yeah, it's a really difficult problem. Um, we think there's a lot of uh, benefit that we can bring um, to customers by producing uh, some functionality that handles this really well. So we've tried to speak to as many customers as possible and really come up with a really a rock solid implementation of, of how we can manage this problem. So this is what a item potency module would look like for a, uh, Lambda, um, function. So again, you'll see there's a, an item potent annotation, 
But also we've got a constructor here, and this is uh, setting up the configuration for, for item potency. Uh, in this case, we're going to use a, a DynamoDB table as our persistent store because we can get some really uh, interesting um, functionality from DynamoDB. Um, that is implemented as an interface. So if you have another uh, persistent store that you would like to use for your own systems, you can implement the, the interface and, and carry on. Uh, in this case, um, if we uh, don't have an item potency key that is sent uh, as part of the request, we will hash the event and use that as a key. Uh, that isn't always ideal because if you have uh, a client which is sending you know, a date timestamp or, or some sort of um, changing element of the request, then you'll always get a different hash even if the actual important information is still the same. So we can actually uh, tell uh, Lambda Power Tools to exclude some particular keys. So if you, if you find that the majority of the message is correct and should be hashed, except for this date field that always changes, uh, we can handle that in that use case as well. And if you do have a, a message that is uh, well-formed and does have an item potency key, you can specify the key as well, uh, and we'll just take that. Okay, so how does it work? Let's talk through uh, a use case. So we've got a request that comes in, and, and maybe it does have an item potency key, uh, and that's really great. It's got an item potency key of ABC. Well, uh, the Lambda Power Tools is going to check with DynamoDB and see if it's seen that before. Uh, if it hasn't, it's going to say that you know this is the first time you've seen that, and you should process your business logic. So Lambda is going to execute the handler method, and then just before the response, it's going to save that response with the item potency key into DynamoDB, uh, and then respond as normal. Okay, so this is the normal uh, everyday use case. If we get a duplicate uh, message, so a message with the, with the same item potency key, uh, Power Tools is going to check in DynamoDB, but it's going to see that there's something there already. Okay, and it already has the response that it should respond with recorded in Dynamo. Um, so Lambda doesn't know as not to uh, follow your business logic. And it also knows the response that you should respond with. So it's just going to shortcut that. It's not going to execute your code. It's just going to respond straight away. So that's really neat. Uh, you know, you're really uh, reducing the amount of, of code that you have to write and, and error cases that you have to handle. Okay, but but you know the the, the awkward situation is well, what if you have two requests that are simultaneous? You know, so. Uh, Requests are always ordered, but what if you know you're still in the middle of processing while another request comes in? And obviously, uh, Lambda only handles one request at a time, so these are going to be on different execution environments. Um, so it, it, this could be a hard problem. Well, in this case, when Lambda uh, first gets a request, whichever request comes in first, we're going to do a conditional write to DynamoDB. So even if there are two simultaneous requests, there will only be one that succeeds, and the other one will throw an exception. And that exception will uh, produce uh, an error to, the, to whichever request was second. And then hopefully that client that, that had the error would have some retry logic, and it would retry, and then it would fall into the, the second request uh, uh, section. So hopefully we've covered a lot of bases there and we've, we've covered a lot of uh, problem scenarios for you. And you know, we're really interested in this area and really hoping that we can, we can save people a lot of time and effort. I think we've really found an area that um, is difficult and you know, we've put a lot of effort into to producing this. If you're really interested in this area, you know, I'd love to talk to you about it. You know, are we missing any use cases? Uh, how could we make this better for you? So. Uh, really easy to find the project. Google search for uh, Lambda Power Tools Java. You'll find our GitHub page. You'll find our documentation uh, and give it a try. And yeah, I'm uh, looking forward to hearing from people. I'm on Twitter. Uh, my alias is at uh, MarkSales3. And yeah, thank you very much for your time. 
Mark, thank you for this enlightening presentation. Uh, and you are absolutely right regarding idempotency because when banking transaction happen twice, it's not really good. Only in case when it's top up of a balance. In other cases, no. <laughs> So, Mark, uh, I think now the audience's favorite part, questions. We have uh, a few questions. Um, first of them is, uh, in the past, approximately one year ago, I tried to use Power Tools together with Corpus, but I couldn't get it to work. Should this work nowadays? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I guess it should do. It'd be interesting to see what they've tried. You know, hit me up on Twitter. Let's uh, let's share some some ideas. Um, yeah, let's have a go. Okay, I think it could be find out in Twitter. Yeah, Caucus is um, awesome, so it'd be great if they could work together. Yeah, we hear about Caucus approximately in all topics uh, <laughs> that were discussed today. So uh, the next question, is there a way to put a parent tracing ID for Lambda to build a sequence? I'm not sure. It would depend on on what was happening in, in the larger architecture. Again, it's uh, I think I need a little bit more information. So yeah, hit me up on Twitter uh, or uh, get a hold of me in some way. And we'll, we'll talk it through. Yeah, and also regarding metrics, uh, how long EMF metrics returned from Lambda are stored, uh, are stored in AWS server? Um, I think they are uh, compacted at different periods, uh, I guess like a lot of time series databases. I can't remember off the top of my head what the different periods are. Uh, I think it's probably going to be in the order of a year or more. Not doing very well with the questions, am I? I think, Mark, it was really interesting presentation and uh, the questions are really deep diving. So it's need time to use some documentation. <laughs> so thank you very much, Mark, uh, for joining us today, for supporting Ukraine. And I'm happy to see you here on the stage and see you on the next uh, conferences. <laughs>